happy. Tweets from the CEO didn't count anymore. You know, a blog on the company values yeah. page or a poster or changing your Instagram. Th there was a real demand. Yeah. It was an idea, an embryo, right. and you, you got so excited about it, which I'm absolutely. still excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the greatest challenges humanity faces today is inequality. But you know, I grew up in India, uh, in the slums. My parents worked really hard to get, get us out of it. <laughs>
haven't been given that that access to opportunity yeah. and so you know something for me i i also like i think that we are as a species going straight into the, the species chat, as, yeah. as as a species we're still sort of controlled by a set of um sort of behaviors that are based on psychology evolutionary mm -hmm. psychology that were baked in back on the serengeti way back yeah and i think there's a lot of companies out there you know who have tapped into that and know how to use it google being one definitely definitely and i think yeah. sort of um the press and sort of you know some of the people who for example own press outlets and whatnot they know that we have this them and us in us yeah and so if you look back at any you know point of bust or boom as we swing from the left to the right mm -hmm. there's always this sort of vilification of the of the working class sometimes sure. you know they're not they're too lazy or you know if they if they wanted healthcare they could go and afford it yep. and i i fiercely believe in direct opposition to that and i i, I love this podcast by uh david mcwilliams he's a famous economist he goes to davos yep. every year he's advised obama and yep. bernie and everyone he told this story recently about wealth inequality and they did this study well what they did is they got um a thousand families mm. and they went to a thousand families randomly selected from relatively low income backgrounds and working class okay. backgrounds this is right. in the us and they said what we're going to do is we're going to give you a an amount of money for a mm. second tier college fund and we know how right. much that costs in the yep. united states it's a, it's a significant yep. amount of money and it was put in an account that they couldn't touch and they said what we're going to do is just check in over time right and see how you get on okay and what happened was that by the age of three when these these kids are right at the beginning mm. the, the the families whose kids knew that they had this chance to go to university knew that they had mm. this chance to go to a, a decent college right began to pull away and then by okay. the time they got to primary school mm. they were becoming near the top of the class and the other mm. young people who knew life was carrying on as normal yeah the the, the gulf in mm. in that attainment was absolutely incredible and what they found is they went in mm. they the, the study went into it in more depth the parents were getting more involved and more active in the development of their children right. because they knew That's they had amazing. this chance yeah, yeah. and so i i feel like for me like why i'm so passionate about you know projects like work and about you know a access to opportunity is that I feel like if we're given a chance, mm. most people will, will, will take yeah. it with both hands. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, that to me is so fascinating because that's where sort of where opportunities come from, right? If you were given an opportunity and if you knew something is already there mm -hmm. versus something that you have to work for, the way you approach it would be very different, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I tell, you know, uh, my friends and I mean, you, you know as well that, you know, I grew up in India, uh, in the slums. My parents worked really hard to get get us out of it. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing OK. But, you know, it's because of that passion, the, yeah. the working hard and and making sure that I don't want to go back there again. Mm -hmm. right? And I feel like uh, if you think about sort of why this should be a meaningful discussion, not just to me and you but to the industry to the leaders to the government to the society what do you think what do you think we should do better as a society to make sure that there's a better representation across the board yeah i mean i think like the, the world is rapidly changing you know the fourth industrial revolution call it what you want we're moving yeah. towards a more digital economy you know you and i have talked about it 10 years like a 10 year jump forward in 10 months because of the pandemic yes and so you know, it, it's about um, making sure we have a workforce that's equipped yeah. for it. So that, you know, at a government, a governmental level and a societal level, we need to make sure that we're, we're handing out, um, you know, the right skills and the right chances to people who can take them. Because yeah. you and I are both firm believers that, you know, we've had these wonderful careers. You don't need to be a rocket science to, to get ahead in digital marketing. There's so much opportunity there. There's so much right. growth. We're, we're still experiencing experiencing a phenomenal channel shift so i think there's one question around the skills gap and around making those skills available not you know not creating barriers uh to entry and there's a number of ways um mm. that that can that can happen at a a governmental level but industry has to play a part as well mm. and, and i think you know what we've seen from the digital marketing industry over the last couple of years is that they are you know beginning to mm. to to 
um, lower those barriers to entry. I mean, you remember yeah. when we were coming through, Google only hired people with first class degrees, often from very good universities. Now, all tech companies, yeah, yeah pretty and much. Now we're yeah. placing young people at Google who don't have degrees, which right. is which is phenomenal. So, it, so it has changed. But there's also a massive benefit, I think, for business. Mm. Because when you have a bunch of people who look the same, sound mm. the same, grew up the same, went to the same yeah. school, had wonderful upbringings and you know, very well spoken and yeah. charming, you have the same um, ways of thinking. Yeah. And so by bringing in diversity into your workforce, you get that diversity of thought. And whether mm. that's from you know backgrounds, mm. nationality, yeah. whether it's from neurodiversity, and, and you know, yes. again, something that um, is is very much um, a topical thing for employers to to really be facing. It actually enrich all of the studies. You know, go to mm. Bain and McKinsey. They're, they're all publishing studies now, saying that yeah. companies who are embracing diversity see yeah. those benefits at share price level as yeah. well. I, I definitely want to dig more on the neurodiversity bit because we we spoke to a few uh, young yeah. young yesterday, in fact, right. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we get there. Why, why is there a big discussion on diversity and closing that gap? Uh, not for the sake of doing it, but genuinely doing it versus, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. What, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, we talked about this before when, um, so I built a startup, um, uh, an, a digital analytics startup. We were acquired by a media group. Mm. And uh, that, that team was based in Barcelona and in London. And when yep. I built that team, I... Don't I yeah, I, I very much felt I, I really I mean, one of the great things about being an entrepreneur is that you can you can get to choose your team for the first right. time. And I didn't go at that thinking I need diversity in, in my yeah. team. But what I wanted the team to do was to reflect that wonderful cultural fabric that mm. London is. Mm. And so you remember me, you I mean, you've worked with a bunch of yes. them. We had a very strong British Nigerian contingent, David yes. Nwosu, absolute mm. legend. We had Thomas Balchunas from Lithuania, right. Luis Gasso from, from Catalonia, <laughs> Arjun Gill. Yeah. Tahir Fayaz, yes. British Indian lads who've gone on to have amazing success. Right. Yeah. We had Linda Uruchura from Mexico. And the list goes on. The whole you know? world, yeah. And, um, you know, when we went into that industry and saw that it, <laughs> it was clearly lacking in, yeah. in diversity, we, we stood out, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and it did make it did make me wonder. But ultimately, you know, businesses need to adapt because there is still a skills gap. And, mm. you know, it, it's not just, I think, like, you know, I mean, we, you go back to the Black Lives Matter movement and what happened right. with George Floyd. I think it was a a, a flick of the switch right. where I agree. tweets from the CEO didn't count anymore. You know, a blog on the company values yeah. page or a poster or changing your Instagram. Th there was yeah. a real demand from society and yeah. society pushes this agenda. You know what I mean? Like that, that common thought about we need real change yeah. here. And, and so... Fortunately, my social enterprise that was set up to do that. Yeah, action was... speaks louder, louder than words, exactly. for sure. Yeah. I was thinking about what you said earlier that, you know, your upbringing, council estate, very humble background. Do you think that your wiring was different, that you didn't see the difference in, in people, the color, the nationality? Or is it is it something that you had to learn over time? Yeah. I mean, again, goes back to my parents. My dad loves Motown. And so, you know always had there was you know there was never any um mention of or any, any like any like snippet of any racial sort of tension in our house or you know and, and my my parents and my family would call it out as well mm -hmm. you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lie and say there wasn't an abundance of racism in a, in a council estate in a, in a low right. income white predominantly white area yeah you know it did exist so i was very lucky to have that um but it's funny you say, mate, because, you know, when I lived in India, there was a lot there that resonated with me that, like you said, that humbleness, mm. that that sort of appreciation of what you have, mm. but a desire to, to fight and move forward. Yeah. And so for me, I think, you know, I, I think I was, you know, quite lucky to be sort of academic naturally and, you know, mm. nature, nurture, who knows where that line fell. Yeah. But for me, like I always had a personal drive to think, well, my mum and dad got us out of that council estate. Right. So the least I can do is is go and get a good degree and try and get a good job to yeah. to, to pay them back. And um and when you know, when I exited DVI, yeah. um the first thing I did was, was buy them a pad on the beach. Yeah. Like I, I didn't buy a sports car. <laughs> I yeah. didn't didn't get didn't um do all of those norm, normal things it's because it's important to remember your roots and where you came from and your parents and all that, right? For yeah. sure. Yeah. Definitely. You talk about university. 
because uh, you know when we were growing up it's well this is what you have to do mm. you know school and university yeah. and then get a job right do you think the perspective has changed now because you obviously work with a lot of uh, you know 18 somethings mm-hmm. and a mm-hmm. lot of them don't go to university yeah. why do you yeah. think that is and what do you think the future holds for yeah, that yeah i think very much you know when when we would have been the, the message from society when we were at that age was that mm. times are changing you yeah. need a degree to get ahead in life and yeah. so many countries you know for better for worse and and the UK had a changing economy the manufacturing industry had just gone by and so you you've got this huge um working class workforce that they needed to deploy in other industries the service industry was the idea at the time yeah. so it was a huge push both from a conservative and then following labor government at the time to go right. to university and um and some of the subjects that were on offer back then mate i mean they were ridiculous i remember david beckham studies at one of the universities <laughs> at some point and you know i'd love to know you know what jobs came off, off the back of that <laughs> yeah um and ironically i've got a bunch of mates who went into apprenticeships back then and and i've right. had amazing careers we're, we're we're sort of past that now and mm. i think there's there's a there's a growing awareness that there are plenty of jobs mm. that that don't need a university education for you to go on and have a fantastic career right um and what it what i think one of the benefits is though that people who are seeking that vocational training who are mm. you know going into things like engineering or th- yeah. or teaching or whatever um that that require that vocational training that university still plays that very strong role yeah the other side for me and th- and this is something that's really interesting i think because a lot of the studies that show like what are the key drivers of social mobility mm. lots of different sh- studies show it's not how um rich your parents were and what not yeah it is the who you know and i know we're going to come back onto that a little yeah. bit later so having a, a robust um network both from your parents your family and, and what not yeah um allows you to move in circles that offer up opportunities and what not and university does do that going to university with people who are from all over the country mm. who are who are going through an academic journey um allows you to make contacts at a young age that do facilitate that social mobility yeah, as well yeah i mean I I couldn't agree more honestly it's the world that we lived in when we went to university versus now and you know 20 years from now it's going to be very different Absolutely. right so I I think the young people have to start sort of figuring out uh, how do you essentially you know get into the workforce mm-hmm. if they don't want to get to, uh, get into university because skills matter right mm-hmm. you can gain skills at university which is what mm-hmm. we did right that's the path we chose yeah but then if you're deciding not to go to university for whatever reason then how are you going to be skilled is mm-hmm. very important right speaking of which i want to go back to the topic um because it's a very important topic about neurodiversity yeah right um you work with uh, quite a few people young people mm-hmm. and some of them face you know ADHD mm-hmm. or serious anxiety yeah how do you how do they um how, i mean how do you work with them and how do mm-hmm. they actually be, become successful is it is it a hindrance or is it actually a, a a superpower yeah it's it's a really it's a really good point mate um so we you know we at the beginning we we were absolutely adamant we wanted it to be as accessible as possible so regardless of background regardless mm-hmm. of education or experience and something we were aware of was that um there are a lot of young people who are struggling to enter the workforce because of neurodiversity and so right. the first thing i did was find the most incredible trainer uh called Ariane Donohue she's actually a bit of a she won search personality of the year a couple of years ago she yeah. often speaks at conferences up north um she was diagnosed as an adult with autism wow so she, um and 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 this what's been really so we worked with um a specialist mental health nurse to sort of understand what are some of the behaviors around your university right. because i think one of the one of the, the challenges for employers and 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 ed- education uh, institutions is that it manifests in many different ways so ariam for example is super confident like mm. she it could be a t- i always call her a tv host because yeah. she's got this but that is that is driven by an anxiety that manifests from from right. her condition so we very much built the course and we 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 consulted with a neurodiverse charity who taught us how to make the content more mm. accessible to people who are dyslexic right and things like that so we we've really structured the course to be um to be to have that awareness of how people learn in different ways and what not mm. but what's been really interesting now and this is something um we we were talking about at, at the event last night 
was that um, with with some of the young people entering the market who who, who are neurodiverse, it's challenging employers hmm. to to deal with it sure. because it, the, the, what we're doing is saying to them, you know. Um, the young people go to HR because that's one of the biggest problems that we have with WIC actually yep. is that the young people are ashamed and embarrassed to disclose that right. they're dealing with these conditions. But it, it actually is uh, prevalent across the board. It's mm -hmm. not just, yep. you know, the specific set you're describing. It's yep. everybody. Like if I have anxiety, I'd be very conscious of it, but I shouldn't be. Right? Yeah. I should be open and that's how you get help, right? Yeah, and that, and that's it. And what so what, what we do is we encourage the young people to, mm. to go to the HR team Right, and so what we're seeing is businesses who go, well, actually, we don't, we don't have anything in place for that right now. Yeah, exactly. So it it, it means that they got they have to they, they have, have to, to implement yeah. measures that are supportive of people who have uh, neurodiverse conditions. And and what we're seeing, conversely, is that um, people who do speak out, like the young mm. lady on stage at our event last yeah. night, yeah, did when she spoke out and admitted that she's dealing with ADHD, people were coming up to her and hugging her at yeah. the end because that. Having that bravery to, to sort yeah. of um, to, to speak out about it and say there is help, you know, mm. it, it's inspiring to other young people as well who, yeah. who are dealing with that. And what, what we do is we have those young people who've gone into industry come back and speak yeah. on the program about yeah. what, what support is available. What I love about that is no matter what you do, digital marketing or whatever, if you face with any kind of mental health mm -hmm. and you, you know, you're open about it. Mm -hmm. People are there to help you yeah. or be there for you or listen to you. And that just makes us so much human, yeah. regardless of what you do. Right? Yeah. And I, I was uh, very impressed by that young lady as well yesterday, uh, just yeah. speaking out and just making she's sure amazing. that, you know, uh, she's heard, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably one of the bigger, big, mm -hmm. biggest advice you could give to a young person, right? Yeah. It's, it's and again, thinking back to how it was in the beginning of our careers, it's a totally different world. So mm. I mentioned to you that we work with this amazing business called Core Sciences. So they, they do the, the big five personality quiz. Right. And my buddy has this um, way of overlaying analytics on top of it. So it's sort of like people analytics and sure. it sort of shows you from a um, from a neurological and behavioral point of view, how right. it shows me how my personality interacts with yeah. certain members on, on my yeah, team. Yeah, I remember you saying that. And yeah. so when we, because we originally did the Belbin test, which is uh, has a, a more youth orientated version of one of these personality tests. And we did it because we wanted the young people um, to know that this kind of thing happens in industry and knowing mm -hmm. yourself is quite important. But when we brought Evan's company in, um, we thought it might be a little bit too much for them because he really goes into the neuroscience and, and the different parts of the brain and why you behave right. with with um, different levels of um, stimulation mm. in different parts of the brain and that feeds into your personality. Right. Young people today love that stuff, mate. Like people yeah. that they're, they're so aware of like all of the things that drive behavior and things like that. I think mm. there's a much greater awareness of um, you know the the different ways that neurodiversity manifests, and they have this mm. inquisitiveness about the why behind that behavior. So whereas yeah. I'd be like at my desk, panicking because I'm not behaving like right. Joe yeah. next to me. Yeah. Years later, I found out that actually he and I just have very different, different personalities, personalities that, and, yeah. and we, we get motivated by different things, and that that comes out in yeah. how we behave. I mean, this is this is part of the. I guess reasons you have mental health, right? Or issues around mental health is because you start comparing to others mm -hmm. and just because they're acting a certain way, you pretend to act that way. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're going against the grain of your own self, yeah. which creates a lot more anxiety, Definitely. right? Wig Digital, what do you know <laughs> uh, versus who you know? Right. What what is more important? Is it the what you know or yeah. is it who you know? I, I, and how has it changed over time? I just had this like, thing going around in my head at the beginning they say to get ahead in life it's about who you know what not you know what, right not what you know yeah we and we know that we've all heard that right yeah, it's connections such a common it's such a common phrase and so you know i was like let's build this organization that's about um what you know not not the connections that you have let's break down those barriers that you don't need your dad's mate to be working at a company to get a job. Mm. You don't need to go and do a six month un like unpaid internship. Let's let's like bring down those barriers that are stopping young people from entering into our into our industry. On day one of the program, we mm. tell the young people that it absolutely matters who yeah. you know. Yeah. And so one of the things that we do on WIC is not only give them give the young people the skills and confidence and ability to communicate what they've learned. We also 
take those first steps on helping them build a robust professional network. Because you and I know, um, having uh, a peer group around you, you can bounce ideas off. Yes. You know, when you've got a new business idea, I can go meet you in a canteen yeah. and have a coffee. and ch That's really important to career progression. Yeah. And, we, and we tell them that from day one. And having the ability to build those relationships is, is really important as well. So yeah. everybody, everybody on WIC gets a mentor. We have numerous guest speakers. We do networking events with young people, with amazing people yeah. like yourself. And we try and give them that sort of launch pad yeah. from a network perspective. So there's definitely an iron. It's important to know, you know, the technical It's a balance, bits. right? It's a balance that yeah, you need to exactly. strike. So what can the young generation do to increase skills and become more employable? Yeah. And, and let me add, specifically, the young people who are underrepresented. Yeah. Come from a diverse background. Yeah. So, I mean... WIC is an employability program, you know what I mean? We we obviously do all the things we talked about today and at the end of the program we start to think about what are the hacks we can do to get people into yeah. jobs, you know. What how do we undercut the competition and get in? So um so for you know, it, whatever job you're looking for, whatever area, the first step is to get your foot in the door. And and I know mm -hmm. some of our, you know, Gen Z uh, fellows, they they have the ambition and I and I love yeah. that. But my first bit of advice is don't Get in, get in there first, like mm. because once you're in, you can begin to build your career. So, so you find something that is an in, yeah. And then there's three things I think employers are looking for. So number one, that you can do the job. And so if you've been to university or you've had some experience yeah. or you've researched, you've got to research the role and know what know know what you're there for. Um, and obviously entry level roles, you know, ha yeah. have, have those parameters. Number two, they're looking that. Um, that, that you're going to be a return on investment. Mm -hmm. So they want to know that you're going to grow as a professional in there. So you right. need to exhibit to them in the interview process that, um, that that you're going to become an asset, that you're you're already curious, you've already learned stuff, you've already yeah. done things off your own Pre-work. Exactly. And number three, and this is an important one, that you're going to fit their culture. Mm. Most companies think it's their culture that defines them. Mm. So a great hack is to go on to their blog, the, the page on the website about their values, right. look up their CEO on LinkedIn, yeah. go on their Twitter. What are they talking about? Yeah. What is important to them? What awards did they just win? Right. The more research you can do about what a company thinks makes them great, yeah. and then feed that back to them. In the do you interview. know, there was, uh, it's, it's so amazing, uh, especially the last uh, last one. And it reminds me of my time when I was you know interviewing when I was twenty. 22 or something I would actually go to the, uh, um, the agency's media agency's website and look at the clients they have and especially the ones they have right now mm. versus the previous ones and I would actually do a, a bit of a digital marketing audit nice so when I went to the first interview I already had done the yeah. audit and I would speak yeah. about it in the yeah. in the interview Right. And I, I, that's like an amazing hack because it's you're already impressing mm -hmm. and standing out. Yeah. And I think that's so important in this day and age is how do you stand yeah. out? Right. And all of the all of the things obviously you said, mm -hmm. but of course, how do you go about and beyond? Yeah. Versus just research, okay, well, I can do the research. But it goes so far, mate, doesn't absolutely. it? I mean, the times I've interviewed people and I said, so tell me what you know about our company. And they go, uh, the right. recruiter sent It's so me. basic, but yeah. people forget about that for some reason. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. So one thing I've also noticed, you know, having spoken to a lot of young generation is um, the idea of instant hit mm -hmm. or overnight success yeah. or getting promoted in year, two year, three mm -hmm. years in, right? How do how do we overcome that challenge? Or what what's your advice to young people about that area? Yeah, it's a tricky one, and it's it's one I think our generation sometimes struggles with empathy sure. towards that because mm -hmm. you know the uh, the millennials or Gen X, whatever we, we, yeah. we're called, we we were told to just get our heads down and carry on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I I learn a lot from young people in that sense, that ambition, yeah. that you know that knowing what you want and going after it is is a really important trait. Right. But one of the things I always say to young people when they come to me and they're like, Rob, I'm going to quit. I've, I've been there four months. I'm right. not the cl I don't like the client. <laughs> or you know, so the grass is always greener is a very dangerous game to play career wise Absolutely. you know there's no there's no guarantees like if your manager isn't you know supporting you and whatnot mm. and and then you quit and go to another, another company there's mm. no guarantees the next manager there's no be such thing better. as a perfect job there, 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 are, there are always things to, to resolve because what happens if that guy is terrible that girl's terrible then you've lost two jobs in right in, and then you're then you're in that bracket so yeah. i think you know i want to preach patience but it's to get advice from a from a, mm. a breadth of uh, confidence and so yeah. you know 
people who you've got on well with or people you think yeah. are smart and family i think before you you know you make decisions that are, are you know can be perceived as impatient take take on board yeah. advice but at the same time sometimes as as emmanuela said last night enough can be enough and yeah. and sometimes i do respect that you know that right. that attitude of yeah. of, uh, of grabbing it you know it's been uh, amazing having you on having you on the podcast uh, i do want to pleasure. ask you one last question uh, which is which is the title of the uh, podcast which yeah. is dear younger self mm-hmm. so if you were young again what advice to do would you give yourself so i'd say dear rob when liverpool were 3-0 down in the champions league final in 2005 put 500 pounds on liverpool to win <laughs> apart from that <laughs> apart from that <laughs> no no it's a great question i'd say i'd say dear rob um the the anxieties that you feel around failure are always going to feel bad but know that failure is the thing that drives you forward if you don't get yeah. that 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 loop of what's not gone right and implement the changes yeah. off the back of it then you don't move forward as a yeah. as a person as a professional and so amazing while the anxieties yeah. are real it's mm-hmm. failure that will help you move forward absolutely